The design of tension and compression members in a truss bridge. In this lecture, we will focus on the design of the tension and compression members in a short span railway truss bridge. The design will be limited, in scope, to the criteria that we have discussed so far in our previous steel design lectures. Our truss bridge consists of four spans, each having a length of 20 feet, resulting in a total truss length of 80 feet. The bridge houses a single track. So, each truss must be designed for half of the train's total load exerted on the bridge. This lecture consists of two parts. Part 1 covers the analysis of the bridge. The design of the structural elements is presented in Part 2. See the video description field for the link for Part 2 of the lecture. Here is a two-dimensional drawing of the truss. Let's assume the truss is simply supported. I am going to label the truss nodes using letters A through H. Under the applied load, each truss member may be subjected to a compressive or tensile force. We wish to select a standard W-shaped section for each member that satisfies the relevant AISC design requirements. Although railroad bridges are subjected to a variety of loads, in this lecture, we will consider only two types of loads, gravity live load and dead load. The train track, the gravel layer, and the concrete deck contribute to the overall static dead load. Assuming these weight units, we can calculate the load per linear foot of the bridge in the following manner. 200 pounds for the track. 1,680 pounds for the gravel layer. This is calculated by multiplying weight per cubic foot of gravel by this cross-sectional area. Where 7 feet is the width of the bridge deck, and 24 inches is the height of the layer. 1400 pounds for reinforced concrete deck, and 70 pounds for waterproofing material added to the deck. In addition, we add the estimated weight of the steel members forming the bridge to the dead load. The two trusses, the three cross beams, and the bracings at the top of the bridge have a combined member length of 633 feet. Assuming a weight of 100 pounds per foot for standard W-shaped sections, we get a total weight of 63,300 pounds. Since the bridge has an overall length of 80 feet, the truss member weight per foot is 791.25 pounds. Adding these weights, we get a total weight of 4,141.25 pounds per linear foot of the bridge. This load is to be supported by the two side trusses. Therefore, each truss must be able to carry a uniformly distributed dead load of 2.07 kips per foot. The American Railway Engineering and Maintenance of Way Association provides two live load arrangements for the design of railroad bridges. The standard pattern is referred to as Cooper's load. It consists of a series of concentrated loads and a variable length uniformly distributed load. This loading pattern is based on two locomotives and trailing cars represented by a uniformly distributed load of 8 kips per foot. For short span bridges, an alternative load pattern can be used. This pattern consists of four concentrated loads, each having a magnitude of 100 kips, placed according to the distances shown here. The alternative load pattern can be used for bridges shorter than 50 feet long. So, 
Since our bridge has a length of 80 feet, we need to use Cooper's load pattern. Please keep in mind that Cooper's load is applied to the entire bridge and assumed to be distributed equally between the two side trusses. Therefore, each truss should be designed using these load magnitudes. Let's start the analysis of the truss by drawing the influence line for each truss member. Since we have presented and discussed how to construct influence lines in previous lectures, here, I will only show you the drawn diagrams without providing any additional explanation. For a truss member in a bridge structure, the influence line shows how the axial force in the member changes as a unit load moves across the bridge. For example, here is the influence line for member CH. The diagram tells us that when the unit load is at point A, the axial force in the member is zero. When the unit load reaches point B, the axial force in the member reaches 0 0.39. When the unit load is at point C, the member experiences an axial force of 0 0.77. And when the unit load reaches point D, the axial force in the member becomes a compressive force of 0 0.39. The influence line for diagonal member CF is very similar to this diagram. Both diagrams have the same peak value at C. The main difference between the two is the load location that causes each member to undergo a compressive force. Member CH is in compression when the load is near point D. Member CF experiences the same compression force, but when the load is near point B. Since both influence lines have the same positive and negative regions, we can conclude that CF and CH share the same maximum compressive and tensile forces. Therefore, we can use the same standard section for both members. Here are the influence lines for the members along the bottom cord of the truss. Since these influence lines have the same triangular shape and area, we can conclude that the axial force along the bottom cord of the truss reaches the same maximum value in all four members. So, we will use the same standard W section for these members. Similarly, we get this influence line for members along the top cord of the truss. So, we can use the same W section for both members. The influence lines for vertical members BF and DH have the same triangular shape and the same area. So, we will use the same standard section for these members. Since member CG does not carry any force, I will omit its design in this lecture. And here are the influence lines for diagonal members AF and HE. We will use the same standard section for these members. Having the influence lines, we can easily determine the maximum axial force in each member due to the applied loads. Let's start with the dead load. For the members along the top cord of the truss, the axial force can be determined by multiplying the magnitude of the dead load by the area under the influence line. The area under the influence line is 47.2. We can multiply this area by the intensity of the distributed load to get the axial force in the member. Since the influence line is drawn below the x-axis, the top cord members are in compression. So, the axial compressive force in each top cord member due to the dead load is 97.7 kips.
we have two influence line diagrams for the members along the bottom chord of the truss. The area under each influence line is 35.2. Therefore, the axial force in each of the members equals 72.86 kips. Since the influence lines are drawn above the x-axis, the bottom chord members are in tension. Here are the influence lines for the vertical truss members. The area under each influence line is 20, resulting in a tensile force of 41.40 kips in each member. Here are the influence lines for diagonal members AF and HE. The area under each influence line equals 46.4. Therefore, the axial force in each member equals 96.05 kips. This is a compressive force. While the other truss members are subjected to either a compressive or tensile force, CF and CH could be subjected to both compressive and tensile forces, but at different times for different load positions. To determine the total area under the influence line, we need to determine the location of this point. If we refer to this distance as x, this distance becomes 20 minus x. Using simple geometry, we can determine distance x. It equals 6.72 feet. Therefore, the base of the triangle representing the negative region of the influence line is 26.72 feet. And the base of the triangle representing the positive region of the diagram is 53.28 feet. Hence, the net area under the diagram is 15.3. Note that the net area is positive. Under the dead load, these diagonal members are subjected to a tensile force of 31.68 kips. This table shows the calculated member forces under the dead load. Determining the maximum axial force in each truss member due to the live load is rather involved. In essence, we need to identify the location of the train that causes the force in the member to reach its maximum value, regardless of the direction of travel. That means, we need to consider two scenarios with regard to the direction of the train movement. When it is moving from left to right. And when it is moving from right to left. Two important points to make here. 1. The train location that causes the force in a member to reach its maximum value could be different for different members. 2. The distributed load here has a variable length. Since the length of the bridge is 80 feet, the distributed load could have any length from 0 to 80. Let's examine how the movement of the live load affects the axial force in the top chord of the truss. Here is the influence line for members FG and GH. The symmetrical shape of this diagram tells us that the same maximum axial force develops in the top chord of the truss, whether the train is traveling from right to left or left to right. So, we only need to consider one of the directions. I am going to assume the train is traveling from right to left. In principle, we need to try all plausible locations to determine the train's location that causes the axial force in the top chord to reach its maximum value. Without going into the calculation details, let's examine the graph of the compression force in members FG and GH as a function of the location of the front axle of the train. If we define the right end of the truss as the origin of the coordinate system, 
then this horizontal axis shows the distance of the front axle of the train from the origin. The vertical axis shows the compression force in the top chord members. Note how the compression force initially increases as the train enters the bridge. The force starts decreasing when the front locomotive leaves the bridge. Since the influence line consists of a negative region, without any positive regions being present, the distributed load would have its maximum effect when it spans the entire bridge. The compressive force in the top chord of the truss approaches zero as the distributed load moves off the bridge. A close examination of the graph indicates that the maximum compressive force in the top chord develops when the front axle of the train is positioned 114 feet to the left of the origin. At that location, the magnitude of the compressive force in members FG and GH is 254.82 kips. Let's see how we can use the influence line to calculate the compression force in the members for a specific train location. First, we need to determine the height of the influence line under each load position. Since the influence line forms a triangle, we can use the geometry of the diagram to determine the needed heights. They are To determine the compressive force magnitude, we multiply each concentrated load by the height of the influence line at the load location. We then sum up all the products. We need to add to this expression the product of the distributed load and the small area of the influence line below the load. Here is the contribution of the distributed load to the total member force. Hence, the compressive force in the top chord of the truss for this specific train location equals 254.82 kips. We can write a short computer program to perform the needed calculations in problems where many train locations must be examined before determining the maximum force. This graph was generated using such a program written in Microsoft Excel. To determine the maximum tensile force along the bottom chord of the truss, we only need to analyze one of the bottom chord members. Let's use member AB. I will use the Microsoft Excel application program we have developed for this lecture to determine the maximum force in the member. Here is the axial force graph for the member, generated by the app. As the train moves from right to left, we can see that the axial force in AB increases until the front axle of the train has moved 78 feet to the left of its start position. At that train position, a tensile force of 193.48 kips develops in the member. As we can see from the graph, at no other train position, the tensile force in AB exceeds this maximum force value. So, we can conclude that the maximum tension force in the bottom chord of the truss equals 193.48 kips. To determine the maximum tensile force in the two exterior vertical members, let's analyze member DH. Here is the axial force graph for the member created by the Excel app. As you can see, the peak tensile force develops when the front axle of the train is 38 feet to the left of point E. The magnitude of the force is 131.1 kips. The same maximum force develops in the member here, when the front axle of the train moves 94 feet to the left of point E. So, we can conclude that under the live load, members DH and BF are always in tension. 
the maximum tension force in both members equals 131.1 kips. To determine the maximum force in members AF and HE due to the live load, we only need to analyze one of them. Let's consider HE. Here is the member's force diagram, generated by the app. This diagram is for the scenario in which the train travels from left to right, resulting in the maximum axial force in the member. The maximum compression force in the member develops when the front axle of the train has traveled 78 feet to the right. At this train location, the magnitude of the force in member HE is 255.05 kips. So we can conclude that the compressive force in the outer diagonal members has a maximum reach of 255.05 kips. For the interior diagonal members, I will use member CH. When the train travels from left to right, we get this axial force graph for the member. When the direction of travel is reversed, we get this graph. If we examine these two graphs closely, we can see that the maximum tensile force in the member develops under this scenario, and the maximum compressive force develops here. This means that we need to consider both travel directions in order to correctly identify the maximum tensile and compressive forces in the member. The peak value in the positive region of the graph occurs when the front axle of the train is 53 feet to the right of the start position. The peak value in the negative region occurs when the train reaches this position. When only the negative region of the influence line is loaded, that is, when the distributed load reaches close to the right end of the bridge. At that train location, the magnitude of the compressive force in CH equals 20.84 kips. When the train travels from right to left, we get a maximum compressive force of 37.52 kips when the front axle reaches 28 feet to the left of the start position. And when the train reaches this position, we get this peak value in the positive region of the graph. A comparison of these two scenarios reveals that the absolute maximum tensile force in the inner diagonal members is 126.4 kips. And the absolute maximum compressive force in these members is 37.52 kips. Here is a summary of the analysis so far. As shown here, most of the truss members are either in compression or tension. The only exceptions are the inner diagonal members. Both tension and compression forces develop in each member, depending on the position of the live load. However, the compression force produced in these members is relatively small. We need to combine the dead and live loads for design purposes according to the governing design provisions. Although the load combination equations and the design methodology provided by Arema may be more fitting for the design of steel railroad bridges, but since we are following the load and resistance factor design methodology in our steel design lectures, I am going to use the load combination equations provided by the American Society of Civil Engineers. For our purposes, two of the ASCE load combination equations apply. 1.4 times dead load and 1.2 times dead load plus 1.6 times live load. The equation that gives the largest value governs. We get these values from equation 1. And equation 2 yields these values. 
As you can see, equation 2 governs the design, since it produces larger axial force values for all the truss members. So, we will use these values as factored loads when designing the truss members, which is covered in part 2 of the lecture.